I'm very happy indeed that you all have come. And I have a mayor from Greece, from Turkey. I am sitting between these two mayors. And the problems of mayors are similar, I believe, irrespective of tensions or non-tensions between countries. I do not want to give you any long introduction because I want to give the floor to you. I would like to suggest that we will proceed uh, by country. We will start with Turkey, then move on to Greece. Then to Italy, we have only one mayor, unfortunately, but we are happy that we have at least one. Thank you very much for your um, presence, Bienvenuti. And then we will listen to our experts. Of course, we do not have a gender balance here, unfortunately, but you will get one minute more to make up for this imbalance and to make up for this. Otherwise, we cannot offer you any more. I would like to ask all of you to be very brief. We have very little time, and please speak to the point. And as we are so many, we would lose the audience if we speak for too long. Five minutes is the absolute maximum of the time allotted to you. And we want to have a real discussion. We do not have a sequence of statements. I should like to ask you to concentrate on the most important issues. What is your most important issue? What is the most urgent issue you have to deal with first? And where and by whom do you expect support? And also in the interest of the interpreters, please do not read. You would have to read slowly or if you read too fast because it's not impossible. It's not possible because it's when texts are read very fast, it's not possible to assure a proper interpretation. I should like to start with Mr. Atatürk. I've known him for a long time and I know his commitment for human rights in Turkey. And anyone who knows Turkey knows exactly how difficult the life of a Mr. Atatürk can be. Uh, but we are still full of hope and courage, although the situation is highly difficult. So, Ahmed Türk, you have the floor. The mayor of Madi. I should like to thank you very much for these words of welcome. I should like to welcome most cordially all the participants, and I should like to thank all those who have made contributions to the organization of this conference. 173 kilometers, this is the length of the border. Um, the distance between Mardin, the city where I'm the mayor, and the border with Syria. And therefore, I'm really a witness, an eyewitness of the fights also in Syria and the conflicts there. And our city is first and foremost dealing with the urgent issues and problems of our refugees. When the internal conflict in Syria broke out, Turkey was in a position in which, first and foremost, it concentrate it was concentrated on positioning regime critical groups. And the more time passed, and the more the influx of refugees became larger and larger, the faster we reached a situation where today we have more than two million refugees who are accommodated by us. But we have to consider two perspectives. On the one hand, you have the perspective vis-a-vis -vis the regime, those who fled from the regime, the critical of the regime. On the other hand, you have the refugees who uh, are Kurds and who come from Syria. The Kurds, um, of course, when there was this resistance around Kobane, they were forced to leave the region. And 150,000 Kurdish refugees were on the border with Turkey. And I must be very open that the Turkish state of 150,000 uh, refugees on the border only admitted 15,000 and offered them support. So our Turkish, uh, our Kurdish population in Turkey did a tremendous job and was highly committed and uh, 
took great pains in order to help the refugees who were not supported by the state or to give them basic support. The other are the city uh, Kurds in the Sinjar Mountains. They have experienced bitter things. The Isin were um, forced to leave the mountains. They were admitted as guests in the region Batman and Mardin. And on the basis of their um, religion, of their faith, or because they are acids, the yes, it's the Turkish government did not even use any, did not take any measures to help these people. So we had to uh, shoulder the burden, and we, as municipal administration and as mayors, we tried to uh, uh, act on behalf of these people and to support these. Well, the Middle East is just exploding, and in particular, you have the repression against the Kurds, and this is a very strong thing. And in the media, you have certainly seen that in in Mardin and in Diyarbakir whole cities are being destroyed and the corpses of civilians are still lying in the streets and the family members cannot even bury them. They cannot bury their own family members. And of course, the city administrations have many tasks to perform. That is obvious, but today and tomorrow we will have to take a look at the results. What do we have to do in order to prevent the the existence of such problems? This is the overall question. Perhaps it is possible that tomorrow or in the near future in Turkey, fights uh, between Kurdish uh, population and uh, the Turks, the conflict will be so much escalating that Europe will have to cope with 10 times the um, influx of uh, citizens, of, of refugees. And in order to avoid this, the political, the EU, European Union and also the political actors in Europe will have to do a lot. If we really want to make sure that um, nations coexist in peace, if we have this dream, then we all have to uh, meet our obligations, a world full of dangers, a Middle East full of dangers. What will happen to, with the Palestinians? How will the Kurdish conflict continue to develop? And these are very old, very important issues which cannot be postponed. So the sensitivity and the vigilance has to be mustered in order to come to grips with this problem. If we do that, we will be able to prevent the people from leaving their regions and their homes. Turkey is a transit country in Turkey. We have more than 2 million people, but 600,000 people are in Turkey as um, re transit refugees. And of course, Turkey has to play the role of a transit country. All countries, of course, have a certain obligation and a certain burden to share and to uh, shoulder. But if in a country certain conflicts exist, and if a, an oppressed um, ethnic group uh, makes demands, and if the most elementary democratic demands are rejected, are oppressed, then if in these countries um, the, the old positions are uh, still there, then we have to adopt another attitude which will not allow such a repression. I know we do not have very much time, and I do not want to go into greater details, but I'm convinced that the world has to be aware of this and is in a position and must be in a position to uh, prevent such um, conflict. And everybody in this world has a big has a big obligation to make a contribution to peace in the regions and to work towards a peaceful future and should do that and will do that. So we were in Feigen panel. As with the previous panel, what we heard, namely that the Palestinian question should not be forgotten, and you mentioned that. Thank you also for having pointed to the Kurdish uh, problem. The representative of the Kurdish uh, region have prepared their readiness to organize a world cafe um, and to discuss the Kurdish issue. So if you're interested in getting to know more details, then please do go to this um, cafe so you can address questions to the Kurdish representatives. Now, Martin, we move to the Metropolitan Yabakir, and we have here David Andre. I, I know him from my visit to Yabakir, and I should like to now invite him to present his position. I should also like to 
uh, say that I respect everybody here and I should like to welcome everybody. As Ahmed Tuek said, I should like to start with a uh, quotation from Ibn Hadud. Geography, I quote, means fate. Our territories determine our fate. And the Kurds have um, experienced the exodus in uh, four different ways from the northern Iraq to the after the cruel um, attack of Halabja. After that, we had an internal flight from the Albakash, from close to Albakash, and a very important exodus happened also. The exodus of the Yazidi from the Sinjar Mountains after an attack and an assault of the of IS. The flight of course, involves various perspectives. In Turkey, on the one hand, we have a readiness of people, which is perhaps, um, or perhaps it's the need to simply admit uh, refugees. Turkey, Turkey uh, admitted uh, Sir Syrian uh, refugees as legal refugees, but the refugees from North Iraq were never legally um, recognized as such, and they did not. Uh, they were not recognized with an official status. Those who came from the west were accepted by Turkey, but the further they come from the east, the re the um, their legal status is much worse. In Turkey, we have serious differences between the Turkish government and the local administrations. This negative attitude is reflected by the migration policy of Turkey and in the uh, refugee issue, the Isidian 35,000 from the Sinja mountain have no passports, no documents. They entered Turkey illegally and the local population seeks to accommodate them, but there are also other refugees who stay temporarily but who wanted to go back to their territories. These are about 170,000, and here a large part of them went back to Kobani. And I think it is unavoidable, and this happened in reality, that the local administrations should definitely uh, take positions, clear positions. Unfortunately, our situation changed in that, uh, in that way that we held out our hands to help. But in the meantime, we are in a position where we need help from others. Many of our municipal administrations are um, uh, in, uh, in these, uh, the, we have imposed some curfews and the educational uh, opportunities, the possibilities to attain schools are limited, and we hope that the development will be in the uh, direction of a democracy where nobody can discriminate against other people in Geneva, for example. There will be important conferences and symposia, and I believe there nobody must be excluded or discriminated against or be excluded from the negotiating table. And I think for a democratic and peaceful solution of the conflict, I also have to criticize Europe, the European Union quasi as a sub uh, unit uh, is prepared to outsource this, um, this issue to Turkey. And they want to pay um, some funds. And I want to be very frank, and I have to say that very clearly, we as local um, administrations have not received money from international organizations. It is the minorities, the local population, who support our refugees and who accommodate them. We did never treated uh, refugees as foreigners. We had experienced this fate ourselves. We were on flight ourselves, and we still are in some cases. And we know that these people do not have any influence to bring to bear. And because of some big power games, these people uh, got caught in this situation. They are Christian minorities, Jewish, Hasidic, uh, uh, ethnies, and so on. We are all in this, living in these territories, and we all share these territories, and we dream of a future where we can build up a new East where we can all coexist in peace. We are dreaming of being, becoming a country where our people need not leave their territories in order to get uh, safety and to find safety. I should like to quote Kavafi a verse. You will not find another city. This city will persecute you. Thank you very much for your attention.
Danke. Danke vielmals. Thank you very much. This is perhaps a question I should like to pass on to our experts. How about this outsourcing to Turkey? What are the legal and other conditions that we should insist on in this context? I should like to move on. Erkan Erenci is responsible for the camp in Yabakir. So we can continue right away and we will listen to the report of what the situation is there. You have the floor. <clears throat> I should also like to welcome all participants and I should pay due respect to all of them. And I should like to thank you for having been given this opportunity to make a contribution. I should like to welcome you, to greet you all. On the basis of my activity in a refugee camp, I do not want to make any generalized statements and I do not want to uh, make any uh, two, um, statements that are all too generalized. On the 3rd of August, 2014, no, uh, the speaker corrects himself, 2015 uh, marks the date on when the massacre in the Sinja mountain happened. For days, for weeks, these people walked. They simply walked through the steppes and through the desert in order to reach Turkey. After the Turkish border, we simply took, uh, we accepted and admitted these people from the um, border and we took them to the Albakesh, to Hakadi, to Mardin, to Silt, whatever. We tried to distribute them evenly and we took buses to transport them. As the mayor pointed out, there are two measures that are applied. The uh, refugees coming from Syria experience a somewhat different treatment in Turkey. They at least benefited from some elementary health services. Unfortunately and regrettably, these possibilities, like all other state uh, possibilities to help the Assyriac uh, refugees from the mountains to get the same services they as it is from the Sinja mountains, when they were transported by us in buses, they were looked after, they got basic support, basic care. We tried to build up an infrastructure for medical services and also in view of their possible psychic traumata. We tried to care for them. We tried to use qualified experts to help them. Psychotherapists and psychologists were employed. But all these services are the outcome of the commitment of NGOs in this region. The hospitals did not take uh, or did not admit a single patient from these clients and from these groups. So what did we do? You see, even if the number is, was not very high in the Abrakesh, but we accommodated the refugees, we looked after them and we supported them and we used the funds of the municipal administration in order to maintain the support and to care for them. We tried, of course, also to get the funds from local administration to offer educational courses, to finance them. And for, uh, for women, we tried to create options so uh, that they would be able to overcome these traumata. Many uh, people uh, saw with their own eyes um, how their mothers and their fathers and their children were massacred. There were two small girls about whom I would like to speak. These two small girls came from two different villages. All members of their family had been massacred, and one of the girls was uh, amongst, uh, was, was hidden uh, in a heap of corpses, and she had experienced terrible things. With the help of sociologists and psychologists, we tried to help these girls and to help them and to keep them alive. Turkey did not look at these people. The reason why Turkey did not care, perhaps you know that Turkey more and more um, were, uh, turns to a more sunite um, interpretation of life and faith. But these were accidents. Uh, and 
from the perspective of the Turkish government, this was a reason to ignore these people, to exclude them from all help and support. So we took a position we did not want to exclude these people. And we wanted to make sure that they would not go crazy. So we really, within the possibilities that we had, tried to keep them alive and to support them psychologically with the other municipal administrations. And perhaps you know that in Turkey, the, um, these um, municipalities are different from European communities. If you have a mayor who is an opposition politician, so if he's in opposition to the central government, you have very limited financial possibilities. And in the Sigil Mountains, the situation was uh, so that um, a Turkish or 20 million Turkish teachers were uh, simply take, uh, accommodated by us, and we had limited funds. I should like to agree with the mayors and what they said. We should concentrate on combating the root causes of flight and to prevent these causes. And if we do not manage this, then from the morning to the night, we can speak with any single um, mayor throughout the world, and every mayor will have another story to tell, irrespective of um, of the infrastructure projects and from drinking water to um, wastewater. Of course, these are very important services, but we are talking about human rights and democracy. The Middle East, how can the Middle East be developed? How can we win them? So there was an Arab Spring. Yes. Do we still have time? Yes. When the uh, Arab Spring started, for a moment, the atmosphere was positive, and there were ex expectations that democracy could be introduced in the Middle East. These dictatorships have disappeared, but new dictatorships have taken their place. Thank you very much. Well, with all these problems, we are really impressed. And of course, they are the same problems that I heard 20 years ago when I reported on Turkey. And when I came to your region, I had the same um, interpretation with regard to the situation. So uh, we also invited mayors from other regions who are not in opposition. But you can guess why. We did not succeed. You will know why. But we have another speaker from Turkey. And he has just spoken, Mr. Hanna Rosica, an economist, a scientist, and how can he assess the situation in Turkey? And what should Europe do in these discussions with Turkey? And what would you expect them to do? <clears throat> Thank you very much. I thank the participants, but also thank the, thank the organizers of this panel. I had originally um, prepared a presentation in English, but this was very long. And I heard, uh, after I had listened to the panel to president, I will speak off the cuff and very briefly. Turkey, in accordance with official statistics of the Migration Office, Turkey accommodates 2,700,000 refugees. When Turkey admitted these refugees, no identity checks were carried out, neither in accordance with ethnic or religious measures. So these refugees were simply admitted without checking. And Turkey, irrespective of their ethnic background or religious beliefs, were admitted. So Turkey has a um, uh, gross uh, domestic product of $8 billion, and 1% of this uh, GDP is spent on refugees. The savings rate uh, ratio of private households is only 5% of the GDP. So we are in a situation where a population with a savings ratio of 5% is expected to finance $1 of all the $100 that they earn to spend on refugees. I believe that this is something which we cannot really uh, achieve easily, and this deserves respect. And I believe the Turkish population deserves this respect. In Turkey, you have three 
percent of the population are refugees. If you take a look at the overall population, Turkey has uh, experienced an increase in the population by 1%. This means that over the past five years, the population grew by 3%. But as a result of the influx of refugees, there was a tremendous change in the demographic composition of the country. And this, of course, also impacts on all economic indicators. And this will also be mirrored uh, by the figures in the medium and long term. Now. Uh, from the perspective of the economy, the impact is tremendous. At the same time, I should like to agree with the speakers before me. Some important items should be stressed, I think. There is a Turkish proverb saying, before you do not try the uh, uh, swamp, before you do not uh, find a solution to the Syrian issue, all pains are in vain. I think, uh, I hope the interpreters can um, follow and can translate this, yes. So the Syrian question has to be uh, solved. Otherwise, all other efforts will be in vain. At the same time, I should like to underline the contribution of Turkey, how important these are. What are our deficits and what will have to be done? For many, like in many other states, we have delayed our activities. We have an organization which is called AFAD. This is a type of emergency program in crisis situations. Of course, like other states, we also hoped that with the Arab Spring, there would be democracy, the region would develop uh, like Tunis Tunisia. I'm at the same time the moderator of a radio program for economic issues right from the first day on. Turkey should have set up a ministry for immigration and refugees. And I said that in this radio program, and this still applies. Turkey needs a special body, a ministry with a director, a general we cannot get anywhere. We need a ministry for immigration. Ahmed Türk, the mayor today in the, on this panel, was for six terms also a member of parliament. And he will be able to confirm that we would really need such a ministry. In concrete terms, this means what is it that has to be given priority? Of course, there is a lost generation. Let us forget about the political issue. We are here dealing with a humanitarian tragedy. 750,000 children of refugees live in our country. We must offer these children a perspective. We must give them an opportunity. One of the most important problems of the 21st century is modern slavery. Millions of modern slaves could grow up without a perspective. As the mayor said, the, the uh, Middle East is full of problems. By 2050, 50 million new jobs will have to be created. This is one of the most important problems in the Middle East. And in the future, this will also be a major problem. And the priorities, I would like to speak about the problems in uh, the sequence of priority. Education and training are the most important tasks. The young uh, children and young people must be given an opportunity to get education. So uh, my personal commitment and the commitment of the institutions is focused on this question. What can Europe do in order to give these people an opportunity to seek education. The second priority is employment, jobs. We must to offer people in our country jobs. We have to give them work permits, but at the same time, we have to seek to see to it that they get the skills. And of course, the EU can support them in the upskilling. And another problem is housing and accommodation. There are three elementary needs. This is food, health, and accommodation. And health, of course, is very important. One, uh, I should like to ask you to give me 30 more seconds. And then you have social and political rights that you have to grant to immigrants. And whether we 
officially recognize these refugees um, or not. This is not my area. I don't know. But of course, there's a question of security, a question of uh, how to acquire the language access to uh, language courses must be assured. And the last sentence, I should like to say the following. The Office of the Prime Minister, under this umbrella, we have uh, set up a working unit, a working group. And in the course of the year 2016, eight important workshops will be held to deal with these issues. I'm the general coordinator of these workshops. And I would like to ask you to participate and to help. These workshops will be held under the aegis of the Office of the Prime Minister. Uh, you are all cordially invited to attend. We will uh, accept this invitation heartily. And I think because I admire so much <laughs> Turkey and the Turkish uh, population, I deplore that instead of bringing people together, I see many divisions and disputes inside. But that's another issue. OK, on the next common we are from the And this brings me from Greece to Turkey. So without having to swim, without having to risk our lives, as lots of other people have to do, and I do it in an alphabetical order. I start with the mayor of Lesbos and Spiros Kalinos. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. So let me stress that I accepted the invitation with great pleasure. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you because I believe that you provide me the opportunity to, to raise my voice in an international forum and to unite it with other voices and to call for finally putting an end to this crime, this crime which is going on in the States where people are forced to flee their home countries in order to seek a better life. This invitation offers me the opportunity to contribute and to uh, issue a call for putting an end to this crime of people smuggling. And this has to do with the fact that the European Union is not willing to take appropriate action against this phenomenon. And it leaves the lives of people, the psyche of these people, and the funds to those smugglers, to those smugglers who get a lot of money from each individual refugee. And these are people, the refugees are people who had to flee in order to save their lives. And this is why they fled their home countries. And they are exploited by smugglers. And they can only leave these countries, they can only flee their home countries without the assistance, so to speak, of smugglers who put them into uh, uh, boats that are in a terrible shape and then cross the Mediterranean. 550,000 people have arrived on my island. Unfortunately, they survived this trip, so to speak, across the Mediterranean. And they came to us because they wanted to escape death and they were longing for hope. And on uh, the beaches of my island, I see the people arriving, women with little children in their arms, and they cry because they are so happy that they have solid ground now, that they have arrived on my island. And the only thing we have to do is to put an end to these crimes. And this is absolutely necessary. We have to become active here. And if we are not able to put an end to this war, then we could at least make sure that these people smugglers stop playing with people's lives. And these refugees, these uh, people smugglers are mainly in Turkey, but they also have their henchmen in other countries. And I believe that we speak about a real problem. And this is not the problem of people 
fleeing their home countries. It's the problem of the root causes. It is the war that forces people to flee their home countries. And we start to talk about how to counter this problem. And here we come to speak about borders, as if human misery can actually be well cured by borders. And I can tell you one thing, the key is in Turkey. And I have launched an initiative with the Turkish colleagues, and I really like these people. Like I do like uh, the um, Turkish people. We want to pre uh, <clears throat> prepare solutions that enable us to finally put an end to this smuggling, because what is necessary is to register people under the auspices of the United Na of the EU, excuse me, of the EU and local organizations then not a single refugee will be forced to turn to people smugglers for assistance. A second step would be that after registration, the political decision must be taken by the EU so that everybody within the scope of his or her opportunities should accommodate refugees, that the countries take in refugee. You can not just well leave uh, Turkey and Greece at their own devices. We all have to shoulder this problem. We must join forces. I, as a mayor, as a representative of Greece, we are facing difficult situation. Consider the fact uh, a country that has uh, been uh, undergoing a major economic crisis. And on top of that, we have are faced with the refugee issue. And with the little bit we still have tried to help, although we are in dire straits in Greece because of the economic crisis and the incredible situation we are in, consider the creditor situation we are under. Nevertheless, we have the power to stand up and we shoulder a humanitarian problem. This is a global problem because the assistance provide is provided out of our heart. And I would also like to use this opportunity to underline, well, although it might not be possible to uh, register people in Turkey. Nevertheless, I believe that it is possible to register these people in Turkey because I know that the mayors were ready to register refugees in Turkey. But if there is no willingness at the level of the Turkish state, then my island, which already has to shoulder 75% of the burden, would be able to be um, responsible also for the registration. But I want to put an end to this exploitation of refugees by people smugglers. So if Turkey would not accept a registration in Turkey, I suggest that ships take people to my island so that people can be registered at my island. And I believe that all civil societies, all societies that are not xenophobe would do that. So I'm ready to take in and host lots of people in my, on my island. I'm willing and ready to do all the work to make sure that our brothers and sisters, irrespective of where they come from, get the feeling that they are welcome, that they have found a new home, that they might find a job, a new work and that they can also contribute to our common good. Thank you very much for your attention and apologize for having spoken a bit too long. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, your great uh, vision and kindness. Now we come to Kos, to Georgios Kyritsis. Thank you very much, Mr. Γιατί μου δίνεται η δυνατότητα να καταθέσω τις θέσεις μου, τις θέσεις του Δημάρχου ενός μικρού νησιού, που όλη αυτή την περίοδο ζει πάρα πολύ. Τη 
uh, interpreters have apologized. There's a technical issue. Thank you. So we have been facing a difficult situation. We welcome people who have come from a country far away. Bruno Kreisky said, I'm a liberal. I'm open for everything as regards the economy, but I'm a socialist as regards social rights, and I'm a rebel as regards human rights. And this sentence really summarizes everything. And this reflects this longing of the European Union for establishing an equilibrium between the issues we are currently facing. And this sentence by Bruno Kreisky really expresses very clearly what we need at the European level. We need to find and define measures to resolve the refugee issue. And this is the major issue Europe is facing. And we cannot achieve a target when we develop or insist on dogma. We cannot build new walls, build fences, or close borders. We cannot solve this problem by stirring up fear because I believe that these migration movements are the largest problem Europe is facing, and we have to think along logical lines without fear. We need not, so to speak, close down Europe. We have to show solidarity towards those who need help, those who need our assistance, and we have to do so together. We have to act in a logical manner, and we also have to observe the European values and also towards those who want to immigrate illegally. We have to act appropriately. There are lots of so-called economic refugees, and they are considered illegal in Europe. And we require a joint decision. We need to coordinate the approach, and we need to distribute the refugees fairly. And the problem of refugees is not a problem of Greece or Turkey. This is a general European problem. Everybody has to understand that in Europe. And currently, this has not been understood, there, especially by those who do not accept a fair distribution of refugees, those who deny the situation. They of course, as you might know, it's a very small island with 7,000 inhabitants. And last summer, we took in 12,000 refugees on one single day. So it was like equal number in refugees as in inhabitants. And you cannot understand how difficult it was to cope with this issue without external help. And I agree with my colleague from Turkey. The state has not helped the people from Kos. So it is the people, the people in Kos, the inhabitants, who help and assist refugees. And I would like to thank those who come from Europe on a voluntary basis and help people. We paid a high price as an island, but we've made it. We succeeded. We have survived. And I believe that we will be able to cope with this issue in a better manner in summer should the influx continue at current high levels. But you know, these high costs would not be such a major oof issue if we would see at the same time that the European Union is aware of the problem, is also ready and willing to tackle this problem. It's very difficult for an island with 17,000 inhabitants to take in 12,000 refugees. It is very difficult for a country of 10 million to cope with such a huge wave of refugees when individual uh, European cities that are much larger than our city really do not want to take in 300 or 400 refugees. In Europe, there is no willingness to uh, develop a fair distribution for, of refugees. There are countries who refuse to take in refugees. Some have introduced border 
uh, cross, uh, excuse me, checks at border, controls at borders. We need a common European solution. Otherwise, these flows of refugees would not only present a risk to the Schengen Agreement, but also jeopardize European unity. A European solution means a coordinated joint European policy in tackling this refugee issue. We need fair distribution in terms of responsibility and of refugees in Europe. We require a European solution. A European solution means a common solution within the context of the European Union. This means immediate proceedings for those who have to be returned to their countries. Well, naturally, Greece can not well fully protect its borders. No other country has such a long maritime border as Greece, but this is not the problem as such. The problem is the, the root causes for the problem in uh, the countries where refugees come from, there is an exploitation. The EU agreed on a Turkey on an agreement with Turkey. Have we evaluated the results? Is there an end to these flows of refugees which come via Turkey? No, we must be aware of the fact that the problems are in the countries where the refugees come from. It is not only the borders and the coasts of Greece where we have to cope with this issue. We have to adopt a uh, fair and just approach. For us on the islands in Greece, it is terrible to see and witness young people, children, elderly people who drown. We get used to the smell of death. Can you understand how difficult it is for an inhabitant on an island not to care for somebody who is about to drown? This is incredible. This is something which is intolerable for us. So the European Union has to understand what to do in order to tackle this problem. Well, uh, I would like to say the following. Europe has to face up to this refugee issue and in solidarity when Europe continues to close its eyes to this problem and if Europe introduces new measures, defines ceilings, then the idea of the European Union unity will just uh, implode. We're still in Greece. We go to Kios, and we have uh, we have the Bürgermeister Manolis. And we have the Mayor Manolis Jornos here in our midst. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It is a great pleasure for me to uh, be participate here and be a member of this panel now. And I think that the initiative now is something which is of the utmost importance now. Chios is an island on the eastern side of the Aegean Sea, and it is an island which is welcomed the second largest number of refugees in the year 2015. Roughly 120,000 refugees arrived in 2015, and for us, it was the same problem as with all the other islands on the sea. So we, in the, we had to deal with something we had not known before. And on the part of the EU or on the part of the government, the appropriate mechanisms were not provided. And the European Union was not able to address the issue as a whole. The infrastructure and the uh, relief services provided were built bottom up, and it was sometimes often a stopgap solution, so all the gaps were closed. So I just try to tell you what we did. There was a small center for registration with the Greek police and the Greek police has really 
taken an all-out effort. They worked overtime. Each individual police officer worked overtime, striving to register everybody, if possible, who has arrived. So on a daily manner, the Coast Guard saved the lives of thousands of people between Turkey and Kursa. There are lots of people who work overtime, who undertake every effort to make all this possible. After registration, the uh, municipal institutions provided assistance, but most of all, the volunteers who since March and April provided both food, they uh, provided clothing, water, in order to help these people. Since August, the um, influx of uh, refugees increased. Instead of 300, 400 per day, we had 800, 1,200 uh, refugees per day, and the city of Hills was filled with people who, who lived in tents. There was no other opportunity than to accommodate them in tents. And also such a, an inverted commas invasion well, had an impact on the lives of the inhabitants of Chios. Almost everybody was ready to provide help and assistance in their courtyards, in their houses, in their apartments, in the middle of the city. They were ready to help. In August 2014, we had suggested to establish a center where refugees could register so that people can be accommodated there for one or two days. But this only became possible recently. We made this suggestion to the Greek government. We also suggested that to international authority. Unfortunately, this was not accepted. But now the EU hotspots as a term were created and we already had all taken all the necessary measures in order to facilitate the introduction of these hotspots. And before refugees were registered on the premises of some inhabitants of Kios. We reached agreements with these because, as I said before, hundreds of refugees arrived on a daily basis. A new camp was also set up where refugees were accommodated until they got their tickets for the further on passage. And there are three remarks and two proposals. Our first remark is islands are closed systems, not only in terms of the environment, but also economically speaking. So large fluctuations is something these islands find hard to cope with. And this does not only hold true for the issue of refugees. As mentioned before, this also means economic-wise, also in terms of the tourism industry. The second problem is, well, people live in a, so to speak, imprisoned situation. They are locked in. They are on this island. And this is also very important for the development and for the psyche of these people. They believe that it is a risk. They believe that it is risky for them when all of a sudden they are faced with huge numbers of other people and don't know how to tackle that. And this is a problem for the people because they are not used to that, the local inhabitants. Well, the best solution of all is peace in Syria. But today, Syria is the issue. Tomorrow, probably, it is another country, another hotspot of war. So what the EU has to do is to find a holistic solution. We need to join forces. We cannot have a common policy on lots of issues, but no common policy when it comes to the issue of borders. 
the opportunities have to be created to make sure that passage and access is safe. Now, the relationship to the Syrian people is put to the test, but the most important assistance is providing help on the ground in Syria. And it should be possible that all countries take in people, except refugees. And I'm in favor of dealing with it now appropriately, because later on it will be increasingly difficult. And uh, we have here representing the Mayor Kamenis, uh, Lefteris uh, Babanyakis. Please. I wish you a good afternoon. I thank you for this invitation. I believe this is a very important event. I will not repeat what the other mayors said before me. I agree with them fully. I agree with them. And I should like to highlight some of the facts so that we see what is happening. 2015, more than 800,000 people uh, entered the Greek territory. There were more than 3,500 people. Uh, bodies recorded and in December when the weather was very bad hundreds of thousands of people came to Greece 3,000 people a day and you cannot imagine what this means to a country you can imagine what happens when in spring the weather will be better these people 13,000 people uh, applied for asylum Greece is a transit country but Greece is a European country it's a member of the European Union it's not in the same position as Turkey or other countries. It is now a transit country, but in the future, it's not sure that we will be a transit country. We do not ask ourselves whether we will close the borders, but when will they be closed? When you take a look at the situation, then you see that we have a very uh, negative development. Austria decided yesterday that fewer people can be admitted, fewer refugees can be admitted. And I believe it could also happen that uh, this uh, will uh, be the same uh, process in Greece. I've uh, taken notes of lots of things, but Mr. Swoboda said we should be brief, and I should like to say that the problem in Athens is one thing. The greatest problem in Athens is one, namely finding accommodation. Where can we accommodate these people? Of course, we have very few reserves in the different communities. I do not want to talk about this topic in detail. I just want to give you a general view. Although Greece is not an immigration country. We have, uh, since last year, uh, had a ministry for immigration, and there are no special services or bodies that deal with uh, refugees. We uh, simply pursue a policy, policies. We cannot hire any additional staff, as the mayors pointed out. We cannot simply hire new staff and additional staff. This, uh, we were asked that we should do more with less funds. Uh, the policy of the European Union uh, the policy is uh, to uh, exert pressure on Greece. This was unfair and it was the r wrong political course. I don't want to justify Greece, but if we want to deal with a European uh, deal and we just look at this uh, from the perspective of a balance sheet, this is not acceptable. The second problem is less a problem of Athens with regard to the islands. Apart from the islands, uh, Athens is the only municipality that has admitted a lot of uh, refugees, particularly in Leonis. And our mayor was even um, indicted for having made available these accommodations, and he's now in court to defend himself. So this means that we were accused. So the mayor was accused by the Nazi, uh, the extreme rightist party, because he had made available all these accommodations for refugees. So as you all know, we unfortunately, and this is the perverted situation in Greece, we have a Nazi um, regime. So uh, at that time, these decisions were taken now with regard to the external problem. Now, you, the European Union decided to pass on the to pass the buck to Turkey and to pass on the problem. So Europe <clears throat> has simply passed on the buck to Turkey. 
the EU got rid of this problem and decided, just like Spain or Morocco, <coughs> to solve the problem by donating funds. But take a look at this problem. What does it mean you have to pay so that people don't cross the fence? So <coughs> the, the EU wanted Turkey to get the funds in order to solve the problems that we really have in Europe. We had expected another procedure, and as the mayors already pointed out, <coughs> either we will uh, cooperate in Europe or Europe will be destroyed. And this is the true, the decision was really wrong. We have to change our attitudes. We have to understand the dimensions of this problem. It's not a problem. Uh, it's a situation that we have to come to grips with. And unfortunately, with our decisions, we simply bend to the demands of populism. And if we don't stop populism, then our ideas of Europe will disappear and will be lost. So. OK. We move on to Italy. Unfortunately, we have only one representative from Italy, and we are very happy that you are with us. And we are happy that the mayor of Busalo has managed to come here. You have the floor. Uh, hello, thank you for this invitation, and a cordial welcome to all participants in this international conference. I do hope that at the end of this conference, all what the mayors had said and what the other participants had uh, contributed will be uh, included in a document which can be submitted to the European Union so that this cry of pain of the local representatives and the difficulties that were described here will be heard at the EU level. First of all, I should like to ask you to not to um, call these people as refugees, economic refugees, migrants, political refugees. These people are human beings, women, children, men who have dignity. These are human beings, people who have the right to be respected as human beings and to be treated as human beings, to determine their own residence in any country of the world in order to try to improve the conditions of their lives. In accordance with my experience, I can say, <clears throat> So I, my experience started four years ago in 2012 in my community, Gonzano, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Libya, hundreds of thousands arrived in our port of Bolsano. This is an experience that we made. And we had to uh, shoulder the burden. Many volunteers cooperated. Uh, primarily, uh, volunteers uh, made themselves available to help these poor people who fled from war and distress and hunger. And the European uh, Union has a tremendous um, responsibility, just like the United Nations, because they should see to it that these wars will be stopped, that better economic conditions can be created in these countries, countries which are now plagued by fear and hunger and misery. All these people who come from the other side of the Mediterranean, they are forced to leave their countries in order to conduct a dignified life. I believe that the West has failed and has received a lot, has gotten a lot from these countries, and now the time has come to give something back to these countries. In my country, not in my uh, community, not in my city, but in Italy, from Rome towards the north, there are political speculations given the difficulties that the Italian citizens are encountering at present. And they themselves find themselves in economic difficulties. And there are many in favor of a deportation of the refugees because of their poor economic situation. I should like to mention two ideas and permit me to 
fully endorse what the mayor said. We are all in the same boat. We have made the same experiences. And the other two ideas are addressed to those who argue that these people have to be rejected. The people who say that probably saw some pictures on TV, some photographs in papers, but they did not realize the drama, the tragedy that these people are suffering. I should like to request you to sit on a bench in the port of Bolsano and to see hundreds of people who arrive, women with small children in their arms or uh, pregnant women who come who are totally wet, who are thirsty, who uh, are thirsty and hungry. And I want to ask you whether you would be prepared to tell these people that they are not allowed to uh, come to solid ground. So uh, or would anybody go there and would say, well, when people want to uh, reach the K, you would not definitely step on their hands. I do not think that anybody would do that. In 2014, 28,000 people were received by us in our port, and 1,300 were unaccompanied minors. To, in 2015, 17,000 Perhaps um, many uh, arrived via uh, Greece or Turkey, and thousands of uh, unaccompanied minors reached our country. I would like to say the following about the unaccompanied minors. When their parents on the other side of the Mediterranean who um, put a 10-year-old child uh, into a boat and say, Please go. I'm not sure that you will arrive alive. It may happen that you will drown. But if you really happen to arrive on the other side, then your life will be better than here. And we will certainly not see each other anymore. What do you think are the motives of such a family to influence such a 10-year-old and to, f for to send this um, child into a life-threatening adventure unless they are not plagued by a terrible situation in their own countries. And in this period, I believe the mayor, the community, and the inhabitants of Bosano are receiving these people with great um, sacrifices, but also they are convinced that they want to continue along this path. So, the comment. Okay, we will move on to the experts, and I have a special expert here who is an expert in that he uh, the, he followed the same route. He was on a boat from Afghanistan to Austria all the way. He Mustafa Nouri is here. And he is an asylum seeker, but he is now already active. And he is a helper. He helps other um, refugees. And he uh, wants to help others uh, because he wants to thank the country. And uh, what was your path? Can you describe your path? What were your experiences? What happened on your route from Afghanistan to Austria? I should like to welcome all participants. And I want to say, Mr. President, I welcome you in particular. And I welcome you. I, I greet you. And thank you for this invitation. I come from Afghanistan. I'm called Mustafa. For three years, I have been living as a refugee here in Austria. And three weeks ago, I got a positive uh, decree. And I now have the status of a recognized refugee. Now, a few words about my route and my flight. I can say a few words about my home country in Afghanistan. Ever since 38 years, war has been waged in my country. Millions of people from, for, were murdered for different reasons. And for 38 years, there had been no peace in my country in this year because of the war and because of the persecution millions of ghani uh, had to leave their homes and in their search for a safe place to live in where people are properly treated the war and the persecution because of the wars of the war 
also influence our family and have influenced our families until we found out that we can no longer stay in uh, Afghanistan and lead a safe life. And we had to leave our home country. This was definitely not a simple decision for us. We must not forget that flight is the very ultimate a decision for a human being. Nobody wants to leave his home country uh, voluntarily and uh, does not want to leave behind his friends and his family. In, uh, in my opinion, the term economic refugee is a stupid word which does not have any meaning and this is a word we need to avoid. I came with my mother and my younger brothers and sisters and I went to Pakistan and then to Iran and then Turkey. When I arrived in Turkey, I realized that a further flight would be even more dangerous and we thought that maybe our lives would be threatened. On the day we arrived in Turkey, two, two huge boats were capsized and, and went down and hundreds of people died. We were shocked and we thought, what should we do now? This is why I contacted the family of my mother. And for decades, they have been living in Iran with my oldest uncle. I agreed that a family should then uh, accept uh, the refugees and my father, who was um, imprisoned by the Taliban. And we said that he should then go to Iran. But I myself wanted to go on to Europe. I wanted to flee to Europe, where I saw better opportunities for a better life. We all know that Iran uh, did not sign the Geneva Convention, and there you do not, uh, you don't have the right to make an application for asylum. At that time, I was 16 years old, and I had lots of dreams. I did not want to remain in a country where I would not have any rights. Well, the flights in Iran have no right to work. They are, they are illegal, and many um, refugee children have no access to schools, and they are illegally resident there, and they remain Ill illegal migrants for all their lives. A few words about my flight. As a result of the help of my uncle, I organized a smuggler who took a lot of money, who took me from Turkey to Greece. I had to um, join 40 other refugees, many children and women. I had an inflated boat and to cross the Mediterranean to Greece. This was the worst experience in my life. One thing I still have on my mind, it was midnight and the sea was very rough and all of a sudden the engine stopped and uh, then the engine did, could not be started again in the midst of the Mediterranean. We had high waves and we were, we were there and if we had not had an engineer there and who tried very hard in order to start the engine again, we would certainly have never arrived on the Greek coast. With the aid of smugglers, I arrived in Greece. So I got new documents, travel documents, and then I went to Austria via Italy with these documents. I arrived in Innsbruck and I uh, submitted, I, I made my application for asylum and I was then uh, transferred to Treiskirchen. I lived for two months in Treiskirchen and I lived there. Treiskirchen was not easy, particularly when you are 16 year old and a refugee. At that time, 2,000 young people lived in the camp. There were no language courses, no employment opportunities, and no sports apart from running. Running was the only sport. After that, I was luckier, and I uh, joined a small uh, housing community in Vienna, uh, which was run by the Don Bosco refugee 
uh, organization, I was able to continue my schooling and learn German. When I was 18, I did not come to a big camp, but a private uh, home with young Austrians, and I'm still living there, and I nearly automatically became part of the Austrian society. I believe it does make sense, and it is very helpful that we're discussing all this, that we uh, hear reports from different countries and that we are pursuing the same goal, namely that human beings, irrespective of their origin or why they are fleeing from events, are treated as human beings. Uh, so this is something we must strive for. Thank you. Thank you very much and all the best for your future. You can really need it, Ms. Schweighofer. So how do you experience this situation as an artist, as a human being, having listened to this moving story and now seeing how Europe and Austria hold different views? So what's your view of the situation? Well, I know the situation at the border because I worked as a volunteer in September. I was in Hungary in rescue at the Serbian Hungary border, and in December in Antomini in Greece, and in between in Patrino of Hope. And at the beginning of this migration movement, it wouldn't have been possible to solve the situation without the volunteers because otherwise there would have been a huge humanitarian disaster. When we arrived, there was nothing except for three toilet boxes and uh, police officers who kept 4,000 people on a field. Within one week, it was the local NGO, the Hungarian Association, has done outstanding work to, in order to avoid the worst to happen. Volunteers came from all over the world, and slowly also the larger NGOs came. What happened there was really fascinating, just to see and witness what was going on, how many people took the initiative and who helped. And this was one of the most important uh, things I've ever experienced, that uh, people from uh, different well, uh, social classes organized themselves. They organized something together. And this movement, well, uh, created a huge group. And this uh, covers all strata of society. And, well, this group has huge know-how and uh, good expert knowledge. The situation at the border has changed over the last two months. This acute situation where people were kept for weeks in camps, which were designed as interim camps, the situation has changed when we went to Greece only recently. We visited several camps, and now the process is such when people arrive from the Alliance, they go to Athens, then they go by bus to Idomeni, and there the Macedonian border. Only the people from Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq are allowed to travel onwards. All the others are sent back. And from Idomini, they go by bus to Brezhevo in Serbia. On a daily basis, 1,500 people cross the border. And then from Brezhevo to Slavonski Brod or to Shit, and then to Slovenia. And then uh, they arrive at the Austrian border. And well, since only recently, they arrive in Spielfeld. Most realistically, only 1,000 people cross the border, while more than 3,000 arrive on a daily basis in Greece. So according to my most recent experience, I can absolutely understand that Greece urgently needs assistance, because what happens to this two-thirds well, these are refugees which are either classified as economic refugees or who do not come from Syria, Afghanistan, or Iraq because they have nothing to lose because they have been sent back several times. And Greece has to, well, deal with these people. And as I've seen in Athens, 
there are no resources in order to provide for these refugees. So what is happening? The question is no longer what happens to uh, the uh, refugees from Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq who stay here, but what about all the other refugees? So what's the future? So the trip only, well, is lasts one week. This doesn't mean that the situation at the borders are glorious. People have to walk uh, in the cold for several kilometers and consider many of them have children and it's very cold now. And also there is a lot of basic provision for people's needs. UNHCR, the Red Cross, they are very active, but the system more or less relies on the help and assistance by volunteers. And it's not only uh, providing uh, or making sure that people are registered and then, well, sent on. But what is necessary is that people do not lose their dignity throughout this process. And this is an aspect which is managed very well by the non-professional helpers. While on the other hand, on the hand of the army, for instance, well, this way of treatment is not always guaranteed. It is very important to, well, take, don't turn these refugees into, for instance, sheep so that people are not used to be pushed from the left to the right, and they must not be patronized because they lose their own responsibility. And the more they lose their own responsibility, the less you can expect them to take the initiative, the less you can expect them to cooperate. And I believe that the whole thing can only be solved by cooperating as far as possible with refugees you know, you cannot patronize them uh, or provide a structure. And once uh, this structure has been exhausted, then you can not give up and say, oh, we can no longer provide for them. Long-term structures, sustainable structures have to be provided. Because what I see is that many refugees help other refugees, and those make a lot of positive experiences. They experience the Austrian society in a different manner. This gap between cultures is experienced in a different manner. They build bridges. A hybrid society is created, and this is beneficial. And this is what I call well, the strength in this crisis, to focus on what can be achieved, the opportunities created, the potential we can tap in, and what long-term models of coexistence can be developed based on that. Because I don't believe that a fence at the border contributes to uh, preserving the European values in any way. I don't believe that this will contribute to the further development of our society, of our structures. We had faced that before, before the crisis set in. I do not lead, believe that a fence at the border creates some added value or enriches a society. It doesn't make us more vivid, more awake, more attractive, not more human either. And I believe uh, that a border uh, and a fence at the border does not pay value added tax in the long term. Thank you. Thank you very much for your work, uh, personal, and to all the NGOs. So you have attracted, you have drawn our attention to one thing. The way you deal with refugees has an impact on how refugees act later on, so how they deal with us later on. And then that the Balkans is a region we have not considered because we did not want to do so, but it would have been too much from an organizational point of view here for this conference, because when your um, um, advice is not heeded and when uh, Fences are erected at the border. We must not um, forget that this will definitely backfire. We have two speakers who are used to uh, giving presentations. Today they had had to listen for a long time, but now they can react. There are two questions which are very important in my view, but you can also address other topics briefly, uh, please. And this is the key role of Turkey. On the one hand, 
it was mentioned that it means outsourcing, shifting the problem to the shoulders of Turkey. But we know that without involving Turkey, it will not be. It will be very difficult to solve certain problems. And then the second topic is people smuggling, and especially the mayor of Lesbos addressed this topic of people smuggling. Well, uh, you, for instance, uh, the young man from. Afghanistan has paid a lot to people smugglers. So what can we do in order to counter this uh, phenomenon of people smugglers? And now, Professor Novak, our experts on international law, and Professor Bender, would you please comment on that? Mr. Novak, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I would also like to start by sharing with you a personal experience. In October 2010, in my then function as the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, I was on an official mission in Greece on all the islands that are represented here around the table and also in Athens. And I have some most incredible things there in the migration detention centers that had been set up there where people, where well, the centers were really filled with people. And in Athens, refugees had to sleep out in the streets without any support. And then they were attacked by right-wing radicals there. And don't tell you that in order to criticize Greece. No, the authorities have undertaken an all-out effort, but the burden was too high. Because at that time, roughly 90% of all refugees who came to Europe came via Greece, uh, via um, uh, the Evros River. They came to Greece. <laughs> There's a problem with the speaker's microphone. And. Um... and What we called for at the time was that because of the Dublin regulation, nobody must be returned to Greece because they were overtaxed. And then we had people who wanted to continue on an onward uh, journey. We again sent them back to Greece. Unfortunately, the European Court for Human Rights put an end to that. But looking at the current situation, well, we start to close borders, to introduce ceilings. So what's the consequence of all these actions? We have already witnessed that we from Austria will shift the problem to Slovenia and then on to Croatia until it ends up in Greece again. So when we continue to pursue this line of policy, then within the immediate future, we will see a humanitarian disaster in Greece, in spite of all the goodwill and the establishment of hotspots is a nice idea. But in the long time, this will be detention camps. Whole islands will be filled with refugees who are registered there, but who will also have to stay there. We will have to make sure that a key is to be developed, a key which does not work. And then according to this key, these refugees will be distributed uh, across European countries. But this policy of renationalization, uh, which is evolving, is a major risk in my view. So outsourcing to Turkey, well, there are two sides of this coin. On the one hand, and this had been discussed before, it makes sense. And the European Union could do much more. And I'm not only referring to humanitarian assistance, World Food Program or UNHCR. More money should be spent on them and more money is to be spent so that refugees in Lebanon and in Jordan lead a dignified life. No, what is important is to offer perspective to these people, economic perspectives. And there the EU could do much more. But this is not so much outsourcing, but this is cooperation with Turkey. But when you believe that you could, well, uh, shift the problem to Turkey so that they uh, are well asked to protect the fortress of Europe, then this wouldn't work. 
and what is currently being discussed is turning Greece uh, into a safe third country, and this uh, would be in consistence with the ban on reformor, because we see that Syrian refugees from Turkey, and we have recent reports from Amnesty International that this is the Shen Refoulement. So they are sent back to uh, Syria, and this is a tightrope walk, which is, well, it is a, a walk on the razor's edge, and this is very difficult, and this had been addressed by AZ. We require and we need Turkey as a cooperation partner, but well, well, uh, but what do we actually give to the regime? Uh, and then, well, uh, the issue of people smuggling. This, uh, we are in fact responsible. We, is Europe, we are responsible for that crime of people smuggling because we took away the opportunity from Yefuji to legally apply for asylum. So when I erect the fortress of Europe and do not well issue visas, then in the situation you have just mentioned, they are in such a situation, they are desperate, they want to come, and the only opportunity they have is, and you explained that very nicely, they just have to uh, put their fan, fate in the hands of these criminal pig, people smugglers. And if we want to tackle this issue at the root cause, then the only opportunity, in my view, is to uh, provide refugee legal access to uh, asylum proceedings. So this is either possible uh, by allowing them to enter legally via visa. I don't see much opportunity for that. And then the next opportunity is to enable them uh, to apply in third countries uh, for asylum or via resettlement. So we have to create legal opportunities. And this only works when we have a common European asylum authority with a common uh, European asylum proceeding, and they have outposts in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Jordan, and there people can apply for resettlement or for asylum. Well, we will not be able to uh, fully abolish uh, this crime of people smuggling, but then people, if they have a certain hope for coming legally to Europe, then they do not have uh, much reason for using the services of people smugglers. Thank you. Mr. Bender from the European Stability Initiative. Mr. Bender from the European Stability Initiative. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I want to subscribe fully to what Manfred Novak and also others here have said on this issue of uh, on the idea of building fences, of closing borders, which I think would drive the problem further down and would end up in a would end in a in a humanitarian tragedy. I think the solution definitely cannot lie uh, in such an approach. Uh, maybe I could use my few minutes to say something on this other question you have raised on kind of the role uh, Turkey plays in, in, in this whole uh, issue. I think outsourcing is maybe, a, I don't know, uh, not a very happily chosen word. I mean, let's not forget that Turkey together with Jordan and Lebanon is sharing a far, far bigger share of the burden than uh, the uh, European Union member states taken all together. Uh, a few months ago, the European Stability Initiative, the institution I'm working with, have come up with a few ideas, a, a proposal to, on the one hand, how to re-establish control over the external Schengen border, which we think can only, is only possible in close collaboration with Turkey, but on the other hand, how to allow also a large um, resettlement of Syrian refugees directly from Turkey to European member states, in particular Germany, Austria, Sweden, those which are affected, um, without having the refugees to take this perilous journey over the Aegean and then over the Balkan route, which in winter also uh, is very dangerous and puts people at risk. Both elements, I think, have seen some momentum over the last weeks. Um, but still, I mean, this idea of resettlement to the European Union has been voiced also by Ms. Merkel, but it has stayed at a very rhetorical level. It's not concrete, it's very vague, and it's not very credible if I look at it from a uh, perspective of a Turkish policymaker. And also the engagement with the EU, uh, with, with Turkey, you know, from the European Union side is, is, is not very serious. Distrust is very high on both levels, both from the side of the European Union when we look at Turkey, but also uh, the other way around. I think it's important to understand that 
uh, even if a Turkish politician says, you know, we will, we will sort of cut the, the, the refugee flow and, and, and cut, you know, uh, the, the, the smuggling of people over the Aegean uh, to, the, to the Greek islands. I think even if he wants to, or even if Turkey wants to, this is very, very difficult to achieve um, by such a sea border with such closeness between the Turkish mainland and the Greek islands by Turkey itself. I think what it would require is is very, very close cooperation between Greece and Turkey on an unprecedented level. I think it would mean that Turkey would have to take, or to assure that it would take all refugees which come to Greek islands back. Yeah. This, I think, would require a readmission agreement with, between Greece and Turkey, which exists. It would also require that Greece would declare Turkey a safe third country, <laughs> not necessarily uh, safe country of origin, but a uh, safe third country. Um, and for this, uh, it would, Turkey would, of course, need to implement the asylum legislation, which is in place since 2013, which is in force since last year, but which so far has not really been uh, successfully implemented. Uh, Greece, on the other side, I think, would need drastic uh, logistical preparation in order to do this. Uh, it would need help from other EU member states, it would uh, need to uh, plan uh, and, and start planning now. But why should Turkey do this? Um, I think when, when we look from a Turkish perspective, trust in what the European Union promises is very, very low. Uh, coming back to what you have raised, Mr. Andley, I mean, of the three billion which are sort of uh, floated around as the big figure, very, very little uh, can be seen. Uh, in Turkey. The promise of visa liberalization is kept very, very vague, uh, and the plan to take contingents of Syrian refugees directly from Turkey to European member states is about as credible as the failing plan to uh, resettle uh, the 160,000 um, refugees from Greece and Italy inside the European Union. I think we stand at about 330 uh, uh, at the moment. <laughs> So it's not credible at all. Um, I think we, we cannot wait for a European Union solution. You know, with the East, there's so much opposition to this inside. I think we, we will not, you know, in order to address the crisis. On the longer term, yes, I think we need a, a new European asylum policy, but it will not come in time to address the crisis which we face now. I think it's up to the member states which are most affected, Germany, Austria, Sweden, and ideally joined by others like France, the Netherlands, uh, to take the initiative. Um, and if we want Turkey to take back refugees from the Greek islands, I think we would need to make a very, very clear commitment to take on hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees directly from Turkey in the coming months, bring them directly by plane, avoiding this dangerous route. This would involve direct planning with Ankara. Uh, People could be taken directly from camps where they are registered. The Turkish authorities have you know, their nationality, their names, they are fingerprinted. Uh, one could choose also on humanitarian grounds, giving precedence to families, to unaccompanied, unaccompanied minors. Um, and uh, then I think this level of trust you know, could also be addressed in a, it's very difficult at this stage. Everyone agrees to engage with Turkey uh, and for Turkey to engage with the European Union. But on this side, things would become, you know, not lose promises, but it would be, become actually real, you know? How many asylum uh, seekers have been granted asylum in Turkey? How many uh, refugees have been taken back from Greek islands? But on the other hand, Turkey can also count how many, you know, refugees, uh, Syrian refugees from Turkey have been taken, you know, over uh, by Germany, by Austria, uh, by Sweden. So if there is no trust, I think it can be built through uh, achieving concrete results. So this is only a sketch, it's only uh, a very brief, and I think it's also very ambitious, I agree, it's difficult, but I cannot see any other way how to actually um, bring back uh, control over the external Schengen border, which I think we need to do uh, if we don't want to leave the European Union to the far right in the next two years. I think it's essential for uh, us uh, all. Uh, but at the same time also, I think it would offer a way to keep taking in these people in need in, in large, large numbers and in actually in a better way than what they face now through this perilous journey 
over the GNC and the Balkans. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have some. Haben wir haben noch ein Ask perhaps the two mayors from Martin and, and Jebek here. What would you like the EU to put as a condition or as a main element in the talks with Turkey? Um, do you have concerns or not? In very few sentences. What should the EU say to Turkey on the question of refugees, of course, especially from your point of view, with a very critical situation in uh, the Kurdish region? Teşekkür ediyorum. Basically, the asylum or the uh, refugee crisis, first of all, we have to be prepared to support them and to be open minded. Of course, we have some concerns with regard to the negotiation between the EU and Turkey. We have some reservations. We are under the impression that we are here uh, concerned with the deal of silence. Do not criticize our uh, politics vis-a-vis -vis the Kurds, and then we will meet all your obligations. And in the Kurdish areas, in the streets, you have uh, tanks in the streets, and they are patrolling, and, the, and Turkey wants this silence uh, to conclude this deal. This is our problem. Otherwise, we support the efforts of Turkey to help the refugees, but that this would be the object of a political deal, and that this would be used as an instrument of uh, blackmail. This is something which we which cannot satisfy us. And then there are two different um, uh, yardsticks with regard to the different groups of um, refugees. The Hasidic uh, refugees are re received differently from those from other backgrounds and, and regions. The Kurds in the uh, Middle East are brandished ever since the resistance in the Sinja mountains and in Kobane. The, since the time when they resisted the others, they have a certain status, they are perceived, and this is something which also comes into play and which also has to be part of the humanitarian discussions. If Turkey tries to play the refugee card in the policy against the uh, Kurds, then there must be no silence. If this should be the case, then this is an item which will uh, cause a lot of concern for us. I should like to first of all express my um, uh, satisfaction when I hear about the efforts in Italy and in Greece. And I uh, found out here at this negotiating table that our hearts are close to one another. We understand the sorrows and needs of all of us. And we, I believe that the momentum is a very important. These are the dynamisms that are possible for coping with these problems. The further up in the polit political hierarchy you uh, deal with these topics, the further you're away from the problem. And uh, from my city, seen from my city, I have to say that if Turkey, if the EU um, simply passes on the buck and uh, outsources this problem to Turkey, then in my city, for 50 days now, we have had a curfew in Turkey. This is a city in Turkey. And we've had this curfew for 50 days. The international organization and the NGOs cooperate with Turkey, but are the people in Irbak, in Batman, in Churina, are they not also part of this situation? What happens if these people of our cities in Turkey given these curfews and these measures, would then simply try to go to Europe and, and leave the country. Well, I believe here we have, we need common networks, common projects. Also, this has to be harmonized. And if the EU makes available funds, then we 
uh, in a much better position to manage these funds. We do not consider ourselves as an institution. We are representatives of the people, and therefore we have a word to say. Who wants to answer, or perhaps we can briefly answer, the, the European Union decided to strengthen, to defend, and to control the external borders. We know Greece, there are so many islands, so they also represented here. Is this feasible at all? In what way can this be achieved? Can this Schengen border really be defended? And we will Schengen be maintained? Will Schengen exist? How do, do the Greek representatives see the possibility to defend the Greek border. Oh, how do you see this personally? I should like to say that the agreements and the legal provisions are passed so that problems can be countered in the course of time. If you see that the laws are outdated, then they have to be adjusted, they have to be amended. Today's situation, for the first time, uh, affects the whole world, and we need not simply stick to the past, but we have to find new solutions so as to be able to cope with today's and you know, tomorrow's problems. The situation is uh, visible today. Tomorrow, the situation will be worse for Europe and for all of us. But the longer we are waiting, the longer we will have such a debate, the more we have to also consider that every day people are suffering and every day people lose their lives. And this has to be stopped immediately. And I also believe that we uh, have to consider everything from a different perspective. And the fear is have to be overcome because very often people are afraid of what is not known or people suspect that something will go wrong or that something cannot be coped with. Very often the uh, bad situation exists between the Greeks and the Turks and they don't believe that they can understand each other. But I can assure you that we at the level of self-organization and self-management are in a position to negotiate and to understand each other and to find a solution. And I do hope that we will be able to achieve a result. I think we are very close to a result. The question is, will Europe follow this uh, result which we can uh, achieve? Or will we simply allow problems to continue? And will we pass the buck to others? And others will have to assume responsibility for finding solutions. Well, my colleague has said something very important. Since 2011, Turkey uh, entered into agreements and signed agreements with the EU uh, in order to handle immigrants from Afghanistan, from Syria. And at the same time, Turkey is a country which is waiting to become a member state of the EU. So if now Turkey wants to play this card of the immigrants in order to gain access to the European Union and to put pressure on the European Union for admission. As, as the colleague said, if Turkey really uses the uh, Kurdish problem as a card to play, then the problem is much bigger. Turkey is at the junction, and as my colleague pointed out, he said, well, Turkey is uh, has a key position, a key role to play. We have to clarify a number of things. Turkey must have control. The EU must also control these procedures. We uh, must not allow a situation where people are drowning every day in the sea, in the Mediterranean. How can we simply accept that we have the islands in Greece and people are dying off the shores of these islands? And how can we watch this? How can we accept this? these difficulties for young people like the young man from Afghanistan? How can we not find a solution which can, of course, not a problem that cannot immediately be solved? But I mean, you do not believe that if the war in Syria will be uh, finished, that there will be a stop, there will be an influx of Kurdish in refugees. We have to find a solution, including Turkey, of course. 
as I live on an island and there is water between other islands and my island, I do understand something very well. Austria can do something tomorrow, namely to close the border. We cannot do that because we are living in an island and anybody can uh, take a boat and come. There are no borders. The only thing to survey the borders are agreements for the readmission of uh, refugees. If you do not apply such a method, then there can be no control over the borders and not with humanitarian means either. Of course, you can use other means and instruments, but you don't want to have such other means. So this agreement for return and readmission and the possibilities of granting safe asylum for those who are entitled to asylum, these are the possibilities that we have in order to protect our borders, the European borders. The more we close the borders, or as long as we close the borders, the external borders of the EU, and particularly uh, in Greece, because we have a very long coastline, is really not the solution. The immigration is a natural phenomenon which has existed for thousands of years. We must, of course, take a decision as to how to cope with people who uh, cross our borders and who a uh, man, a person who is with us, we cannot close the borders because otherwise this is the end to Schengen. Well, we do not want to close the borders. The European Court of Human Rights had a famous case at the time of Berlusconi where there was an agreement with Libya's Gaddafi and it was clearly stated and judged that if people come via the sea to, into, to Italy, so Italy is not allowed to return them. Italy has to accept them. And then we had Mare Nostrum and there 150,000 were saved from the uh, sea and how did the EU react? This would be a pull factor, so the borders have to be uh, controlled. So we are under the obligation to help people who come via the sea. We must admit them. We are definitely must not return them. Definitely not. One more minute. Okay. Closing the Schengen external border, controlling, I think that's a big, big difference. It should not mean that no one should be able to cross this border. Uh, second thing, <coughs> because it has been mentioned, I think it, it would be very important to keep separate the issues which relate to EU membership <coughs> negotiations, the criteria Turkey has to meet, the democratic deficits, the issue in, in, in Southeast with, with, with the Kurds, or media freedom, etc., and how we partner up with Turkey on the refugee crisis. I, I completely agree. If we if we start mixing this and you know and selling sort of EU criteria stuff against cooperation in the refugee crisis, I think this would be a frank disaster. Thank you. Any last question, I can see for sure. A last question, Mr. Shakova. You talked about the civic society and you talked about different countries. Is this a hope for Europe that this uh, civil society really uh, persists? Can it give a new impulse to uh, Europe, the civil society from the south to the north? Can this civil um, society show more commitment or the same commitment? Is this more than support to refugees, which is much? Yes, of course. The self-efficiency in the capacity to organize oneself is very important. This is a recognition or a, a finding that is with us. And this means a lot of hope. So let us close with this hope in mind. And on our minds, and I can tell you that we have received a lot of positive responses from the audience, particularly with regard to the mayor's statements. I do not want to repeat this in different languages, and I could uh, do, do cope with Greece, Greek, but uh, they all thank you for the courage and the readiness to help of the civil society and of the mayors and civil society. And as you said, this really instills hope in us in these sad times through which we are going. Thank you for your active uh, participation in this panel.